Uh, what I'm about to talk about today is uh, over the years, I had a lot of exposure to outer data mining tools as well as uh, a number of other different techniques. And what I learned over the years is it's not just understanding which tool to use, but also understanding how to combine different tools together, as well as learning a number of different tricks that you can do with individual tools is what makes ultimately the biggest contribution to your success. Now, as far as the general outline, what I've decided to do today is even though I had a kind of a super task of talking about all the different things that we've done here and there, but there's 60 minutes or one hour is not enough time to cover it all. So I'll pick some of the interesting topics and hopefully we can cover them all and maybe go beyond that uh, at some point. And I'll start with the list of either Salford or uh, our tools successes. And what you will find here is that not a year goes by as uh, we have one of the major competitions won by our tools. Won meaning not necessarily first place, but it could be second, third, or somewhere near the top. And the amount of time that it took us to prepare some of those results uh, was actually quite interesting because when we enter these data mining competitions, we usually never have enough time. We can't dedicate the whole department working on all of that. And oftentimes it becomes an exercise in some kind of hobby. I mean, it's something that you do uh, at the end of the day or when you have a little bit of spare time. Now, of course, not all of these are won by ourselves. Not all of these are won by me, but there are some <laughs> that are won by either our clients or our users or people who went through our training classes. And back in the early days, like in uh, uh, six years ago when Trinet was the first engine that came out, and back then we were the only ones who had real access to the code who could actually run it. Back then it was relatively easy and straightforward for us to win as the years went by more and more people found out about it, and in terms of winning, it has become more and more problematic, certainly not at the hobby level. Now, but what accounts for the success? Well, the big part, of course, is the algorithm itself. Uh, but it turns out that the things that you can do with an algorithm and how you do it, and there's all kinds of other things and tricks that have to be employed in order to make it really successful. And that's what I will talk about today. I'll start with the churn modeling challenge, which is one of the cleanest, and I would say the most successful challenges that we had. Uh, the description is quite simple. A major telephone, the mobile phone provider, offered the data for international, uh, basically for the competition. We had uh, 100,000 customers with at least six months of service history. And the objective was to predict probability of loss of a customer 30 to 60 days into the future. The reason why I call this data set nice and clean is because they clearly defined the objective. Given what you know about your customers now, try to predict if they're going to leave your company a month from now. Not tomorrow, but 30 days from now, and that hopefully gives you a window of opportunities of what to do with it, uh, I mean, what to, how to deal with the situation. There was a lot of historical information available, overall 200 plus variables, mostly related to uh, cell phone usage, uh, the revenues, all kinds of call behaviors, the different uh, averages, means, standard deviations, on-peak, off-peak usage, weekend minutes, uh, roaming usage, whatever, all sorts of interesting things. On top of that, we have demographics and the geographical information. A very nice, straightforward data set to be run in TreeNet or maybe some other techniques, but there comes first, of course, the data preparation. Uh, well, I could have spent the whole time talking about data preparation because it usually takes 90 to 95 percent of the entire modeling time. Uh, we actually we have a person specifically dedicated in our company to data preparation alone. You probably know him. It's John. So whenever a customer or the new client has to deal with the new project, it's usually the data prep that takes 
most of the time. And by the time you have left for the modeling, it's uh, uh, actually not uh, a significant amount. Uh, a lot of work on missing values, how to deal with them, how to encode missing values. Uh, there's all different experiments that we've conducted. Uh, what I'm going to focus in the remainder of this initial section is uh, on uh, how you could employ CART to actually help you to run missing value imputation and also some of the interesting unexpected side results that you can get. And that's basically the initial part here. Now, there comes the first challenge. There was a variable in the data set that had uh, quite a few levels. In fact, 797 distinct levels, and it's like similar to area code or zip code or something like that. So the, where does the, the customer come from? So the variable is likely to be influential, but the number of levels kind of makes it um, impossible to use a variable like that in the most straightforward and direct way. You can try it. I mean, CART will certainly be able to handle it. One of the biggest advantages of CART since the very inception is that it was designed to handle all such kinds of things. But based on our experience, uh, we've realized a number of times that using a high-level categorical variable together with everyone else, as is, is generally not a good idea. So something needs to be done in order to pre-process that categorical variable and convert it into a simpler version. And there are a number of reasons for that. So we need to find ways to reduce the number of levels. And there could be straightforward, trivial ways. But what we found particularly useful is uh, relying on Carter itself to do all the grunt work and more. And the idea, in general, is very simple. You have all of these categories. You look at them as a just, just univariate task. And then you group together all categories with the similar response rates. Technically, you don't need to have Carter to do that. A simple frequency table combined with the sort operation would, uh, would do. However, the advantage of Carter is that you pretty much can accomplish that operation within minutes. You open the data set, you declare that categorical variable as the sole predictor and with a few tricks, you get the tree structure on the output that classifies, groups together all of the initial categories into five buckets in this case. And you have full control over the granularity. So in this case, we had the initial 50-50 distribution. Now, running Cart essentially produced these five individual bins with very different uh, churn rates. And all of those 700 plus categories were incorporated into the logic of the tree. So now I can take the tree, apply to my data set right in place immediately after building my model. And in the output data set that I save, there will be a node information that essentially compresses all of my categorical variable levels into node dummies, I mean node categorical variables. Now, there are limitations to this approach. It's univariate, so we're missing all possible interactions, all possible kind of fancy stuff. But uh, over the years, we've realized that this is a nice compromise. I mean, it may not accomplish everything that you wanted to accomplish with it, but it's not fully discarding that variable, and in the end, you're getting a useful way to compress everything that you have. Uh, there is a very important trick that you need to learn in order to make that procedure happen. And the trick is you have to use an obscure splitting rule called class probability splitting rule that not all of you may even know about. Because if you try to pull it, I mean, to run this task using conventional genie classification approach, what you will see in the end is a mo most typically a two-node tree because it only groups levels above the initial average on one side, below the initial average on the other side, and all of the remaining splits become irrelevant because the default cart mode is solving classification problem and not the probability problem. But all we need to do is switch to splitting rules, pick class probability, rerun it, and pick your own kind of uh, Make your own choice on the number of groupings that you like, and it essentially accomplishes everything. Neat trick, very simple, 
handles all kinds of high-level categoricals. As far as the consequences, and these are some of the comments that I've just made. Uh, in terms of performance, if you look at the model performance in uh, the Turing competition, uh, without that variable, we have uh, essentially uh, area under RC curve 0.69. If you include that variable in its raw form, and don't forget, we ran three net uh, runs in that particular study. Now, three net is notoriously weak with high-level categorical variables. Well, because it's a boosting technique, it really lashes onto those high-level categoricals, uses them all the time, gives you perfect performance on the learned sample, which ultimately collapses miserably on the test sample, which is what we're seeing here.